Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Stephen Toe, the CEO of Leo Cancer Care, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar, exploring the benefits of upright patient positioning in radiation therapy. Uh, first of all, I hope that everybody listening in is staying well and staying healthy uh, this pretty difficult time. Uh, and then secondly, before we really kick off, uh, just to let everybody know that we are recording this uh, to be shared afterwards. Uh, and please, all questions that come up during Rock's talk, uh, if you could just leave them in the Q&A section uh, and then we'll deal with them all at the end. Uh, so I am delighted to be introducing our speaker for today, uh, Rock Mackey. Now, as most of you, I'm sure, are probably very, very well aware, uh, Rock has been a real thought leader in our industry uh, for a very long time now. So we are incredibly uh, lucky to have him with us today speaking, but even luckier to have him on board here at Leo Cancer Care. So without further ado, Rock, I will hand over to you uh, to talk about the benefits that you see in upright patient positioning. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, it's, a, it's a delight to, uh, to be able to do this. Um, it does get uh, kind of tedious in, indoors all the time, and so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, of course, under University of Wisconsin rules, I have to declare that I have a potential conflict of interest uh, as the chairman of the board and um, founder, and I have financial interest in Leo Cancer Care as well. And Leo Cancer Care is a sponsor of this lecture. So um, there's lots of things that have been maligned before uh, they've been adopted. So for example, uh, side loading washing machines were thought to be too expensive because they had to have a seal. And effectively, a top loader had a big agitator that took up a lot of room. So if you solve the seal problem, um, then you can make a much more compact um, a front loading washing machine as well. You don't have to open the lid and so you can stack a dryer on, on top of it. And effectively now, uh, almost all washing machines um, are uh, designed to be front, front lo loaded. So, Industries can change very, very quickly. We've all seen a lot of products uh, that we thought would last forever. And, and here's an example. In this case, they were all replaced by a cell phone, the modern cell phone. And so, you know, paradigms do change. Uh, and I think that radiation therapy has a potential uh, to have a, a rapid change uh, into upright radiotherapy. So in fact, upright radiotherapy has a long history. Uh, radiotherapy was pioneered uh, in the upright position, uh, even through um, the Van de Graaff accelerators. Uh, these were mount, had gimbal mounts because they could treat horizontally. They could treat um, as well uh, vertically or, or some angles from, uh, from vertical. Same was true of the first cobalt unit and the first linear accelerators. So what happened? So what happened was, um, you know, in the 50s, um, then we still had a lot of patients who were diagnosed at stage four. Um, they were bedridden. Uh, they weren't ambulatory. And so it was felt if you could have a, 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 a C-arm gantry to rotate about the patient, uh, you could treat uh, patient, all the patients the same way, lying, lying down. And then, of course, as we got imaging systems like CT scanners, they were also developed uh, for, for patients being, uh, being uh, on, a, on a couch. Uh, and so when CT really entered radi radiotherapy, it, it pretty, pretty much killed uh, upright radiation therapy. Until we hit really the age of proton and, and particle ther therapy, especially carbonine therapies are so expensive that that, that, that uh, ring, or ring gantries or rotating gantries for them uh, are, are really um, questionable um, to, uh, to really make this field um, ubiquitous. And in fact, the Heidelberg facility here did have room for uh, two rotating gantries. And in fact, one of them was, was replaced with two conventional horizontal fixed beam lines. But you also see here that they're, the patients are on are still being treated uh, in the in this case the supine position uh, using a, a robotic system for positioning. 
And of course, upright proton radiotherapy have uh, employed upright radiotherapy systems. You see a homegrown system from MGH, that's Jay, Jay Flans there, uh, who, who, by the way, is a member of our scientific advisory committee uh, with a barber chair, actually. So a barber chair is kind of ideal. Uh, getting your hair cut is, a, if you like, a head and neck treatment as well. Uh, there are, uh, there's a commercial system from P-Cure. This is a photograph of the chair the end of a robot. Uh, the robot can, can insert um, the chair uh, into a uh, fixed 20 degree CT scanner and then transport them uh, in front of the nozzle. Harvard uh, and MGH pioneered proton radiation therapy at the Harvard Cyclotron. Uh, there they had a, a CT scanner, a, a vertical axis, very slow CT scanner. It would scan uh, head and neck patient um, in, um, in about 40, 40, 45 minutes. So it really was a, a big imposition then to, uh, to try to do radiation therapy there, uh, mainly because of the very slow CT scanner. However, they did pioneer uh, head and neck treatments. Uh, uh, this is an example of improved survival in, cor in cordomas and chondrosarcomas pioneered uh, at the uh, Cyclotron Center before the hospital-based center at Boston was built. And that system was, was pioneered by Herman Suit. And here's a statement from, from Herman, an isocentric gantry systems need to be provided in one or more of the treatment bays, although co in costly in terms of both money and space, which we all know is true, gantry systems are essential for the optimal utilization of proton beams. We would take exception to this and we'll explain carefully why. Isocentric gantry systems, a feature of all virtually all, of virtually all lin linear accelerators, permit the patient to be supine, the most stable position. So yes, it basically a statement, yes, we've done it this way, we'll continue to do it this way, but I think I would argue that the supine position is not necessarily the most stable, or certainly the most medically appropriate. A reassessment of the necessity of, of proton gantries was recently done at MGH, by uh, Thomas Bortfield and colleagues. And they looked at um, beam orientations used for more than 4,000 treatments at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And they were really looking at, um, at whether or not non-coplanar fields were, were uh, utilized. And they essentially said, very rarely are they utilized. Uh, if you go and look at the table angle and the gantry angle, the table angle is almost always at zero degrees except for a few cases, um, another peak uh, here at uh, 270 degrees, basically to treat vertex fields uh, in the brain. So um, virtually all of the radiotherapy uh, is coplanar um, at MGH. So let's look at the perceptions and reality of upright systems. So the first one is the seated position is not medically appropriate. And the reality is this is only true for non-ambulatory patients. But in fact, we don't have many non-ambulatory patients anymore. Almost all of our patients are ambulatory. They're either walking in or they're sitting upright in a wheelchair getting wheeled into our uh, treatment rooms. So let's take a look at this in more detail. So why, where and what sites is radiotherapy most, mo uh, more often medically appropriate? So in the head and neck, the shoulders tend to be out of the way when one is sitting down because the, sh the shoulders are slumped uh, by gravity. Um, the, uh, there's less chance of choking because of dysphagia. Uh, and this is, um, this is important because in head and neck cancer, patients have difficulty swallowing and gravity assists swallowing. It's even, it's even more true in um, esophagus and stomach. And here it's because of gastric reflux. And so there's less chance of choking and of course, uh, if you breathe in the reflux, then you have a great chance of getting pneumonia. Lung has a larger volume in the upright position. We'll spend quite a bit of time talking about this. And so there's less normal tissue in the field, but there's also less lung movement because the lung is more inflated. And so for a given tidal volume, uh, the lung is moving less. Uh, in breast, uh, the breast is not wrapped around the chest. So there's better lung and heart sparing. And I'll, show, I'll talk about this in more detail. And of course, there's less motion um, in, the, uh, in the upright position than there is uh, in, the, in the supine position. In liver, there's less diaphragmatic motion. Again, 
the same issue. But there's also, uh, interestingly, it has been pointed out by Tony Lomax at the Paul Scheer Institute in, in Switzerland, that um, there's a slow uh, drift of the liver when you change the position from upright to supine. And again, I'll show some of the evidence that Tony's put together. So the trouble with the supine breast radiotherapy is gravity. Uh, gravity curves the, the breast around the chest wall, which means that you have to have um, the lung or even the heart uh, in the field. Um, and, uh, and in the um, upright position, then gravity is pulling it front and forward leaning uh, allows you to have almost no, no lung in the field. So if we look at, well, prone is another way to do it. Um, you, uh, you can see that the supine, the breast is, is wrapping around, but and in, in the prone treatments, you're avoiding um, much of the, or avoiding essentially all of the lung in this case. But the trouble with the prone setup is, especially for pendulous breasts, you have to raise the patient quite a ways off of the table. And what this, what this means then uh, is that you have to, you have run into trouble with rotating the gantry. You, you have uh, not that much room to rotate. As well, the prone position is actually hard for a therapist to set up. Um, and so that's why it's not done um, as often as it maybe should be. But um, in, the, in the upright with forward leaning, it's still easy to set up um, the breast. So effectively gravity is, is leaning uh, the breast forward. Um, and uh, at 15 degrees or so, then the breast is in, in front of the chest wall. Um, and it's easier to set up um, than the prone position, which would give equal avoidance of the lung and heart. So let's look at the issue of uh, immobilization. Well, in fact, immobilization has been designed for upright radiation therapy. Um, this is an ocular beam line at Triumph. Um, Triumph also treated with pion beam lines, and so patients had to be kept still for a very long time because the dose rate was very, very low, and it's perfectly possible to do that up in the upright position. Uh, MedTech, uh, now Civco, uh, developed upright mobilization systems. Uh, unfortunately, they were, as you see, sitting on top of couches, and so the combination of a chair on a couch uh, is, very, is very clumsy and it was rarely, rarely used. Um, in fact, Civco has been a nice partner with us in a test of prototype uh, upright positioning systems. Uh, this is in a collaboration with the University of Surrey in the UK and the National Physical Laboratory. They have a very nice um, setup. Um, this is done for video motion capture. And so it's possible then to rotate uh, the patient around and uh, verify that the patients uh, are, are remaining immobilized. So it's possible to have uh, the, the uh, mobilization system for a straight upright um, posture or a forward leaning posture. You see the little motion capture uh, panels um, attached onto the mobilization as well in this. Uh, you can have a vac bag only so the, the patient is sitting directly down onto a vac bag. You see that the arm positions can be varied, can have them up or have them straight out. Uh, you could have an abdominal belt uh, as well. Uh, possible to have no vac logs, but with an abdominal belt and, and some hip restraints. Again, the patient is sitting straight down into the couch and is pretty much in treatment position uh, when the immobilization system is put on. So we think the setup is actually going to be faster in the upright position. So motion uh, is, is felt to be an issue, but in fact, there's less lung motion in the seated position. Um, and in fact, there's less um, motion of the, uh, of the liver as well, as we'll show. So the lung has greater volume in the, in the upright position. Uh, and you can clearly see that if you look on uh, the left side, the uh, A panel, the lung is darker, therefore it's less dense than in the B panel on the right. Um, and this means then that uh, the, uh, there's less normal tissue in the field um, and um, there is a uh, greater volume of, of lung. Therefore, for a given tidal volume, the lung has to move less. And this shows the increase in volume on some patients. The, these, this test was done uh, at MD Anderson Hospital by the group of Lawrence Court. Uh, and clearly you see then there's a big volume differ difference between upright and supine. 
which in the same work translates into less uh, lung movement. So this is showing the, the motion magnitude uh, in, in the supinf direction. And uh, it's reduced by about four millimeters. Now this is the magnitude. Most of these patients don't have uh, all that big a magnitude. And if you can reduce the magnitude down by, by five millimeters, it's possible then not to have to do motion management. There's a very interesting uh, thing that was uh, discovered by Tony Lomax, as I said, at, at the PSI group in Switzerland, uh, where they uh, looked at uh, multiple MR um, uh, images of, of, the, of the patient uh, in the supine position. And what's happening then if you, and they analyzed both the movement of um, the diaphragm here, and the movement of the skin here, you see the, the movements. So, so this is a scan sequence. And, and, and what you see here is the breathing excursions along the diaphragm in three different positions, and the movement of excursions are along the skin. And first of all, you see that the skin is not a very good reflection of, what's, of the movement that's going on by the, uh, by the patient. So, and, but what's probably more interesting is is the is the uh, lung it's uh, the uh, inside the liver itself that there is a drift that's happening over a relatively long period of time uh, the, the as, if the patient is then is coming into the room in the in the um, upright position either walking in or being wheeled in and then they're and then they're laid laid down then what what ends up happening is that the lung is slowly changing its position. And so it takes about 35 minutes or so before you then have uh, 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 the drift uh, has pretty much come to uh, rest. And, and so what this really means then for conventional radiotherapy on a couch, you should actually have the patient lying down uh, about 30 minutes or so, 40 minutes before radiotherapy on a gurney, say, and then wheel the patient in and transfer the patient from the gurney onto the onto the couch. So they, the drift then is relatively large. The, the maximum drift is, you know, can be on the order of centimeters. And so it's, it rivals that of almost the magnitude of, um, of the motion due to the, the lung. But this drift is systematic. So uh, you, you're literally moving out of the field uh, if you didn't know that, that this was happening. So this is because the, you're, you're changing the posture of the, the patient um, and the liver is responding slowly to that change in posture in conventional radiotherapy. Now, if you leave the patient in upright, they're coming into the room upright, you leave them upright, this shouldn't happen. Now we wanna prove that this doesn't happen um, in the future, but, but the hypothesis is, is that uh, for, lung radiothera for liver radiotherapy, uh, we can miss uh, systematically uh, in conventional radiotherapy. So let's take a look at some of the issues. So this is a, a, a pie chart um, with absolute numbers and, and relative uh, caseloads for uh, both sexes in radiotherapy. These are the patients that have mortality that, that really are impacted. Turns out that, that lung is about 20% of the, of the cases world, worldwide, uh, breast about six, stomach about uh, eight or nine, and liver is pretty large in the developing world. It's, it's even larger, about 9% uh, worldwide. Uh, esophagus, about 5%. So it adds up to about 55% of patients, motion's an issue. And these are the patients, uh, of course, that uh, matter because these are the patients that have, um, have uh, um, mort mortality. Let, let's now examine the issue of setting up the patient uh, in the upright position? Is it hard to do? Does the patient feel uncomfortable getting uh, set up there and, uh, and um, during, the, during a, uh, the time for a course of radiation therapy? Well, in fact, um, in terms of comfort, uh, patients often report to therapists that the only time they lie down in their day is when they get radiation therapy and that if they have head and neck cancer, um, they have difficulty swallowing, they would rather sleep um, in a bed that's elevated or in a lazy boy. And the same for esophagus and gastric. They, they worry about um, asphyxiating or breathing in reflux. And so they, 
they don't lie down, they don't sleep in the lying position. Let's take a look at the ease of setup. So these are the steps for the setup on a conventional couch for an elderly patient. There's two therapists involved. The therapist uh, helps the patient sit down on the couch. If they're, in a, if they're coming in a wheelchair, they're more, more often as not elevating the patient to, to help them sit up on the couch. Then one therapist raises the patient's legs, and of course the other one's holding the patient's back, otherwise the patient uh, could easily tumble off the other side. Then simultaneously the therapists rotate the patient 90 degrees and put the, the feet down on top of the couch and lay, and lay down uh, the, the patient's uh, back on the, top, on the couch top. Then likely they're not in, this, in the treatment setup position, so they have to shift around the patient into the correct position. Well, compare that to the steps involved in setup in an upright system. The therapist helps the patient sit down in the correct treatment position. And, and that's because if you had a vac lock bag in the treatment position, they're sitting down in essentially the treatment position, some small adjustments maybe, but essentially you're ready to go. So we really believe that setup uh, in, uh, can be a lot faster in our trials at, at NPL and University of Surrey, it's proving that out. Well, what about um, set up uncertainty in their upright position? This was for a, a back massage position uh, investigated again by the Lawrence Court Group at MD Anderson. And they conclude really there's no difference in the, um, in the setup uncertainty in the upright position as compared to the supine position. And also from the same uh, paper, uh, they showed that uh, they, when they interviewed the patients, they essentially found no change in the comfort difference from a number of uh, categories. So uh, Lawrence uh, Court followed up uh, by having a video uh, and a survey just to see, just to get, um, if you like, what the community's response would be to uh, alternative treatment approaches. The respondents uh, were um, uh, radiation oncologists, uh, therapists, and medical physicists uh, tended to be ones who uh, were in practice uh, for a relatively long time, uh, mainly the, the US, but uh, quite a number from the UK uh, and the rest of the world as well. So what they thought was um, that they thought that upright uh, treatments would be acceptable to patients about 94% of the time. Uh, and more than 80% of the time, they thought that um, uh, the, the uh, upright treatments could be used in their particular practice. And uh, about 20% of the time they said it wouldn't. And, and often those that responded that it wouldn't explained why. And they said, well, how do you CT scan the patient in the upright position? A valid question we'll talk about next. And um, what about reproducible patient setup? Uh, of course, uh, Again, uh, we, we, we have shown, and we have to prove that, of course, uh, multiple times, uh, multiple ways, that you can set up the patient reproducibly and keep them immobile. Uh, plan comparisons uh, and other topics. Um, the, in the general topics, they were generally uh, positive. So let's talk about now the issue of simulation uh, for upright uh, radiotherapy systems. And in fact, vertical, uh, 3D imaging systems now uh, do exist. Um, you know, in fact, again, it's not even new. Uh, I talked a little bit about the CT scanner that was at the Harvard Cyclotron uh, that MGH used. And this was a system at Fermilab, and they had a CT scanner for treatment for new high energy neutron beams uh, that, that Fermilab could uh, produce. Uh, PCURE has a, has a couple of sites in the world. One, one is at the Northwest uh, Proton Cent Center, and here you see Mark Pancook, a medical, the chief medical physicist, and Jim Welsh, a radiation oncologist. Um, and, and in fact, uh, they, they're, they're also uh, on our um, clinical advisory committee. And the, the PCURE system is at a fixed incline angle uh, at 20 degrees. Um, so it can't do vertical scans, but it can do them uh, 20 degrees away from vertical, and it requires a robot then uh, to move the patient from the imaging position uh, to the uh, in front of the nozzle. So uh, you're not imaging exactly in the treatment position. 
what we want to do um, is we want to have a system that can scan the patient in the treatment position um, and can do it at multiple uh, different uh, angles, including purely horizontal for a CT simulator. So here, here you see a, a um, uh, system that, that is uh, at 15 degrees and scanning down along the axis of the same angle as the couch back. In terms of um, MRI, there are two systems that have various positions for uh, um, MR. This one is from Aosote, an Italian company that can scan between vertical and uh, horizontal. And again, this is using this has been used in surgery and for uh, weight bearing on joints uh, to to uh, to to see then um, the changes in in weight loading. Uh, for the spine or for joints. And Phonar has a similar scanner. Again, it can scan uh, between horizontal and uh, vertical. And we have tested um, on the Phonar scanner. Uh, by the way, this scanner has a field intensity that's similar to the view ray. And if you compare a full bladder in the supine uh, on the left to the full bladder in the upright system, you see some uh, obvious differences. By the way, the, the prostate is right here in both of these. And you see that if you have a fixed, uh, fixed uh, horizontal beam line, um, that, that actually it's, it's or a non-coplanar only beam, beam line, if you like, that we actually get less um, bl uh, bladder in the field in this particular case. Now, an empty, we, we would like an empty bladder to be used uh, in fact, radiotherapy patients don't like having to have a full bladder. But the problem here in the upright position is that there's some small bowel that, that comes across and gets in the field. However, there's now gel that's being used to separate the prostate from, from sensitive tissues. And in principle, that could be used in this case as well. And then you could treat potentially with an empty bladder. So that's something that we have to uh, check out. So really what we're doing is we're using gravity um, to assist, if you like. Um, and in, in terms of, uh, if for the, the head and neck, um, we don't need to worry about gravity, uh, but the breast certainly, we'd like to have the breast fall forwards. And so that's a, a useful uh, treatment position, uh, have gravity then pulling the breast in front of the chest well instead of along the side. For, um, for the th thoracic and abdominal regions, we think again, it's going to be useful in case of lung motion, um, you could either have the patient uh, sit, sit it or this is a position we call the perched position and where we actually have the, the pan of the seat uh, uh, supporting the uh, back of the thighs. And we actually have a knee support here so the patient can't slump down in, in either the seated position or the perched position. For the pelvic region, um, the perched position is definitely ideal because you then have the ability not to have to go through um, a long distance through the thighs. Um, and so that would be recommended there. So here you see the, uh, the, the head, neck, breast, and lung, and, and pelvic. And again, you see the, the utility of having um, the knees um, up, uh, up against an immobile, uh, immovable surface here. Couch, of course, can't, can't move away. So you can't slump down here, you can't slump down here or here. So just, this just shows then the motion of the couch, you can change the arm positions this is in the seated position. You can tilt it forward for breast, get the arms up enough, not as, they don't have to go as high up. Um, here, here is a perched position um, and you see then here the, the uh, six degree of freedom uh, the translations can, can move around. So left, right, um, inferior, superior, um, as well as uh, the tilts uh, can be accomplished. And what you see, what you see then is you have a, a, a couch uh, that's relatively easy to set up. You can pick the variety of positions uh, and you can uh, allow for adjustments after the CT scan or optical guidance. And so um, our, our CT scanner will be um, a, large, a large bore. Um, it will have a large field of view. 
uh, and it will be a dual energy machine that's ideal for proton radiation therapy. Um, but, and as well, it will have the ability then to go uh, and scan in the horizontal position for conventional CT SIM. It'll really be the first CT scanner um, designed for radiotherapy uh, in a long time. Almost all, all CT scanners are repurposed uh, diagnostic scanners. Well, this will have diagnostic quality, but it will be uh, designed for the needs of radiotherapy. So uh, just shows the, the relationship of, um, of the R-Proprite positioning system to a treatment nozzle. We're going to pioneer this in uh, proton and carbon ion radiotherapy. You see that the CT scanner is directly above. You're getting an image of the patient in treatment position um, instead of having to transport the patient between a CT scanner and the nozzle. Well, if it's good enough for protons, why not for photons? And so in fact, um, a fixed horizontal photon beam line um, can be employed. It's a stationary beam. It should be less expensive to build a stationary beam. There's less weight rotating a patient than rotating a gantry. You can still have a KV tube if you want. Uh, you don't necessarily need to have a high quality um, a CT scanner in the room, although that's, that's possible here, here as well. Um, and of course, uh, MV Im imaging and the beam stop um, would, would come standard. In fact, it's relatively small. It's much, more, it's much smaller than a conventional radiotherapy system because the couch is, doesn't have to, have, have to move. Um, and so it's possible to make this self-shielding with a rotating shield that comes around uh, after the patient is set up, leaving you a cabin size that's kind of like a European elevator in dimensions. Of course, uh, we're not the first system that's proposed to be fully self-shielded. Uh, the ZAP-X is a uh, stereotactic radio surgery system um, that is, uh, is self-shielded uh, and don't have to be then in a conventional bunker. I like to talk about how MR can be applied in the upright position. Um, imagine a fixed horizontal beam line and, and rotating the patient. Uh, the, the simplification will enable a less claustrophobic, um, larger magnet separation. And um, you know, I particularly like the design of, uh, of uh, Magnetics. Uh, it, Magnetics is an Edmonton, Alberta-based company started by Gino Fallone. Um, and I really like this because the LINAC is in the same the beam uh, direction, is in the same direction as the magnetic field. And so therefore there's no uh, diversion of the beam by the magnetic field and there's no return effect uh, as well. So imagine, imagine this rotated 90 degrees with a, with a horizontal beam line, having a larger separation between the magnets and allowing a patient positioning system to be rotated inside, inside of that. So I think this, the cost of this could be a far less than the cost of uh, a conventional MR LINAC. Now I'd like to shift to uh, looking at flash radiotherapy, uh, again, in the, in the uh, upright position. But before I do that, let's talk a little bit about flash radiotherapy. So um, it, it, table one uh, really is looking at um, the requirements for flash uh, to spare normal uh, tissue. So flash is a very high um, uh, dose rate um, beam line, delivering more than 40 gray per second. Um, and at those dose rates, then normal tissue is spared. However, you do have to have high enough doses as well to invoke the, the, the tissue sparing for normal tissue, at least 10 gray. So at least 10 gray and at least 40 gray per second. Now, so normal tissue then gets uh, a pretty large uh, dose modifying factor, if you like. So the, the, the dose is effectively, um, in terms of dose effect is reduced uh, from, you see, from the, from the teens to, to even in this case, in one case, um, 80%. At the same time then the studies, and this, these studies are a little, a little more limited, um, there's, there's less, uh, there's no dose modifying effect for the normal tissue, so you're sparing sorry, for the tumor tissue. So you're sparing uh, the normal tissue and you're not sparing the tumor tissue. So that's how flash uh, works. And this is a graph that shows that it does take a relatively high dose rate, or sorry, dose, total dose, to invoke the flash effect. So um, this shows that you get separation between conventional radiotherapy and flash 
uh, above about 10, about 10 gray. And so 10 gray is a pretty large, pretty large fraction size. By the way, this is um, a very small uh, uh, animal study and it's a zebrafish, which are very, very small. And, uh, but it's been, it's been shown that the radiation damage, uh, uh, one of the radiation damages in, in zebrafish is, um, is uh, body length. So in other words, uh, the radiation causes the, the zebrafish to be shorter. And uh, the end point here was four hours um, uh, post-fertilization body length. Well, uh, a first patient was treated um, by electron beam flash at, at, at Lausanne in Switzerland um, by, the, by the group of Buris uh, as the radiation oncologist and, and Raphael Mokli as the, as the physicist. And they used a uh, purpose-built uh, 5 MeV um, industrial um, beam. Um, and, and so the electron beam, beam itself that the kind of currents that would be used to generate a photon beam were, um, were, were utilized with no target in. So the no photon target, the electron, electron current that would be used for photon beam is used. Uh, don't try this at, at home. Uh, again, they used a purpose-built machine for this. Uh, and they used, uh, th this was a, the first treatment on a 35 millimeter small tumor volume. So the electron beams over 5.4 MeV. And it was a single fraction of 15 gray in 10 pulses. And the, the, pulse, the total pulse duration, um, those 10 pulses were over 90 milliseconds. So it meant a dose rate of, of 167 gray per second. So clearly up at the dose rate needed and at 15 gray, clearly at the do total dose needed. Um, the um, peak reaction for the skin was at three weeks, um, but it was only a grade one. It, it was, was not a moist desquamation, it was a dry desquamation. And at five months, you see that there's really no, no evidence of, of uh, much uh, uh, co cosmesis uh, problems. And how does it really work? How does flash work? Well, the high dose rate um, is felt to be depleting the oxygen tension inside cells. So the diffusion of oxygen in cells uh, is slow enough um, that you're getting a relatively high dose in um, where the, t the normal tissue is, is becoming hypoxic. And it had, doesn't have as much effect on tumors that are hypoxic. So in other words, hypoxic tumors, uh, this is going to have a great effect, uh, differential effect between the normal tissue. If the tumor is not hypoxic, however, probably flash won't be used for that. And, uh, and um, this is how flash would be delivered for an electron beam. And, and again, if you could do a photon beam, how it would be delivered in a, a photon beam as well. So relatively high, short pulses, have to get them in very quickly, likely under 100 uh, milliseconds or a tenth of a second. Um, and uh, so, so relatively stringent requirements. And of course, for photon beams, there's even more stringent requirements. Because in order to get 40 gray per second, um, you, you're running into issues of having the target melt. So in other words, at 40 gray per second uh, delivered in a, with a conventional target, it would definitely melt. Um, the effect is, is re requires 10 gray to normal tissue. Um, and, and so how do you get enough dose to the normal tissue so the effect is evoked? Well, so the, the tumor, the, uh, the, the normal tissue very close to the tumor obviously will if you're delivering more than 10, 10 gray, we'll get 10 gray to, to invoke the effect. Uh, but but uh, it, at least for conventional um, conformal uh, radiotherapy or IMRT, uh, there's lots of tissue that get far less than the tumor. So that tissue is not going to be affected, at least with flash. You need to deliver the dose within uh, uh, you know, 100 milliseconds, a tenth of a second. Uh, so can this be done with real-time MRI? I think for a single planar field, it, it could certainly be done, image guidance there. If, you're, if you want to make sure there's no motion, um, for example, in the, in, the, um, in the inferior superior direction, you could have a single MRI field um, with that much uh, um, uh, temporal resolution. There is a company, uh, Tibere, uh, that wants to do this with 18 beam lines around a supine patient. 
uh, and do a distributed target. Uh, but so much doses uh, will be delivered, it's hard to, to, to imagine fractionated radiotherapy being, uh, being done. And, uh, and this is certainly a lot of hardware. This is a very, going to be a very complicated machine. And in fact, you know, fractionate, fractionated radiotherapy is the original way that we uh, took into account a differential effect between tu tumor and normal tissue, i.e. normal tissue can repair better than tumor. So we need to, need to design a machine that will also be able to do fractionated radiotherapy um, and not just exploit the, the, um, the flash effect. So how do we do flash and fractionated radiotherapy? Well, you maybe you just need to deliver a single field per day. So imagine then um, that it's a shaped and compensated treatment field. Um, maybe it's a proton um, and electron beam. In fact, high energy, higher energy electron beams uh, at 100 MeV or so look like uh, photon beams in many ways. And at high energies, they, uh, they also scatter less. So that's a, a potential. Um, so, and maybe flash will just remain a proton and high energy electron modality. Um, but perhaps uh, uh, photon beams can be made uh, as well um, and, not have the, and not have issues with uh, the target. So using, uh, using an MRI with a magnetic field aligned with the beam direction so that both electron beams and proton beams are not diverted would be useful. So the magnetics machine uh, would be, again, a, an ideal machine to, uh, for, for flash because you could uh, make sure that the the treatment area was, was in the field. Um, and um, again, it, you could make that magnet, magnetic separation um, and make the magnets a bit bigger then you could rotate a, a upright patient in that system. So some people found it hard to believe when I said, you don't want high energy photon um, beams or you don't need electron beams, you don't need non-complainer fields if you used rotational IMRT. And furthermore, the arguments were accepted by uh, medical physicists uh, who unfortunately had little to say in purchase decisions, um, but, they had, but a lot of time was spent in proving this case to radiation oncologists. And most people believe now uh, tomotherapy was was a machine that, that uh, was coplanar only, it was a single photon energy, no electrons, and it was designed to deliver rotational IMRT. Just like the electin, uh, Electa Unity, in the same way, an IMRT equipped machine, single energy, single electron beam, so too with view ray, so too with uh, the um, magnetics from, and this is a, a photograph of, the, of their previous prototype, not their non-clinical prototype. Um, Varian Halcyon, again, single energy, no electrons, coplanar, IMRT, uh, done with rotation. And the same with this machine uh, that Leo Cancer Care wants to build, uh, essentially following on the, the path uh, started at tomotherapy. So now I'm saying that most ambulatory patients shouldn't be laid down. Majority of patients will get better treatments with an upright posture. Imaging can be done for upright patients. This will result in less operational cost and more reliable systems. Systems that don't have to rotate will be more reliable and less costly. And it'll enable more complex beam generation systems less expensively. So imagine uh, a, a proton gantry that had um, also a heavy magnet system on it. It's just not very feasible given the huge expense of protons and carbon ions. But imagine in the future having fixed upright systems that could deliver uh, MRI-based uh, particle beam therapy. So furthermore, these arguments will be accepted by radiation oncologists who have more training in physiology. So radiation oncologists know, for example, that a chest X-ray is done in the upright position. Why in the upright position? Again because the lung is more inflated, uh, the lung has less density, and there's more, it's easier to see a lesion in the lung uh, against a background of lower density. And so radiation oncologists understand that position could be important in radiotherapy. And certainly administrators understand that lo lowering the cost of proton radiotherapy and carbon ions 
could be important. And so uh, again, we have to probably spend more time convincing the physicists. So I have uh, some citizen science. I know physicists like citizen science. So uh, I have four, I have actually, I think five now, um, citizen science um, tasks for you to do. First is breath holding. Compare holding your breath for as long as you can, say 30 seconds to 45 seconds in the supine and upright positions and compare the discomfort. So for example, uh, lay, lay down, hold your breath, time how long it takes, then recover for a few minutes and repeat it uh, standing up or sitting. The rotation test, get a swivel chair and, and time a slow rotation, a circle, a, a, a time that you know that you won't get uh, nausea because you're rotating fast. And compared to conventional radiotherapy, you're gonna find, I think, that you can easily ro rotate uh, one rotation in 10 to 15 seconds, which is four to six times faster than a conventional gantry rotation. Shoulder slump, have someone photograph your shoulder standing and also laying down, and comment if there's a difference in clearance of the shoulders for head and neck treatments uh, when you're upright. Breast position, compare the position of the breast of yourself, a female partner or a close friend in the supine position and tilted uh, forward about 15 degrees. And finally, move a chair close to a wall, sit down and adjust the chair so that your knees are touching the walls. It is now not possible to slump in your chair without the chair moving back. And if the chair is made immobile, you'll not be able to slump. So, so test out this citizen science uh, and uh, report back. Finally, I'd like to uh, close um, with saying that I think radiation oncology needs to be as progressive as psychiatry. So we see in the left panel uh, from a Woody Allen movie, uh, Woody Allen is, is lying down talking to his psychiatrist uh, in the supine position and move forward a couple of decades and here we see Tony Soprano uh, talking about his, uh, his crime family with his psychiatrist and, and both are in the seated position. So thank you very much. Uh, and I want you all to stay well. Perfect. Thank you, Rock. That was a, a, a really fantastic talk. Uh, we have a, a few questions just to uh, run by you. So I'll just uh, run through those in the last, uh, in the last 10 minutes. So, First one is actually from Tony Lomax. So you were talking through some of his work. He's, uh, he's online. He's, he, he's asking um, pediatric patients, particularly the very young, um, is a major indication for proton therapy. Could very small children that require anesthesia also be treated in the upright orientation? Well, Tony, I know you have kids um, uh, and uh, kids, kids uh, love to be held close to their parents in a snuggly, uh, or, in a, or they sometimes like to be in a, a back, a back uh, 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 carrier. And they're, they're essentially vertical. And they, uh, if, they're, if they're kept warm and snuggly, they do fine. Now their lungs are also going to be more inflated. And so I believe that um, we, we should be pioneering the, the, um, the utilization of the upright position for these babies and kids as well. Um, and there's no reason why a ventilator uh, can't be used uh, in the upright position. And in fact, ventilation will be better again because the lung is more expanded. So again, it's research that has to be done, but I, I really think this might be a better way to treat kids. Yeah, absolutely. I'd, I'd just add to that. I've got a, a seven month old baby as well myself and uh, everybody who's had a baby knows that exactly as you're saying, Rock, they're very comfortable when you're holding them uh, upright close to you but as soon as you put that baby down when it's trying to when you're trying to get it to sleep that's when it starts crying again so okay. I think what we've done throughout all of this is really try and analyze uh, the most comfortable position for not just children but all patients to be in uh, and for very few actually that comfortable position is laid down um, but that's a good question Tony uh, the second question is from uh, Dr Wilkinson uh, who's asked, uh, is there an advantage from an anatomy perspective to treating in the upright position? Well, certainly, again, I went through some of the advantages um, from the you know, head and neck and uh, being able to swallow better, gastric re reflux avoidance, um, lung um, is moves less, less normal tissue in the field, 
liver, liver is slowly moving as you change posture. Um, so if you don't have to um, uh, ha have a change in posture, the liver is going to be moving less uh, uh, for the radiotherapy. Uh, there's also less movement because the diaphragm is moving less. Uh, again, the lung is better ventilated. So I think there's, there's, I mean, all of the, all of the, the uh, abdominal and, and thoracic sites can, I think, be better treated uh, in the upright position. Uh, we've got a, another question here from uh, Thomas Borfer. You've talked about some of his work as well there, Rock. Um, but this one is, what are your thoughts about very fast imaging and treatment to reduce the need for stronger mobilization in the upright position? Yeah, no, I 100% agree that, uh, again, uh, having, having MRI would be a real-time imaging of some, of some sort would be, would be great um, so that you could, um, you could do, either do effective gating or, or, or even utilize flash, uh, which is the ultimate need for fast, fast imaging. Uh, we've got another one here. Uh, how close are you to having a demonstrator established uh, with proton beam therapy? Uh, when and where will the first sites be live? So I'll take that one. Uh, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to suggest that you take that. Yeah, so we we are uh, John. Thank you for asking that. We are in the process uh, right now of putting together our first uh, production representative system. Um, so I will uh, I'll reach out to you afterwards, and I'm more than happy to discuss uh, trying to get something set up if that's something that you'd like to see. Uh, the next one here, Rock, um, any plan to guide the inherent respiratory induced motion? I mean, again, gu uh, guiding uh, can be done um, with, uh, with, with, with all kinds of interesting um, methodology. Um, and so I think guide guiding is important. Uh, but again, if you can reduce the, the amount of, of breathing, the, the, amount, the number of times you have to do um, gating or guiding. Uh, can be reduced. So, but yeah, no. If if uh, for whatever reason, the, especially in in the base of the lung where the, it's closer to the diaphragm, you you may always have to do some some degree of that. But uh, less is always better than more. Uh, and then just a, a a couple more rock. Uh, another one here. Are there any targets or instances that are more challenging in the upright position? Yeah, no, I think, well, you know, things that are different often seem difficult. Um, and so I think most people would view uh, different as difficult uh, until they've had some experience in practice. Uh, the, the therapists that have used the uh, system at Surrey and, and, and previously at Australia uh, when it was tested um, and at and MD Anderson have, have, have found that um, patients can be set up pretty easily. Um, so I, so I think, uh, Again, it, it, we need to have enough training uh, and enough simple systems that you turn uh, different into not difficult. Absolutely. Uh, and a, uh, just a, a comment here from John Chang. Uh, as one who used upright treatments and done some, some of the work in Chicago, I believe treatment motion is significantly improved. Also breathing is much more comfortable for lung cancer patients. Uh, and John is very excited for possible head and neck treatments as well. So we, we totally agree with you, John. Yeah, thanks for that comment, John. Perfect. So um, if there are no other questions from anybody at the moment, uh, we will draw that to a close. But thank you, Rock, first of all. Uh, well, thank, thank you for hosting this, Stephen. And I would just like to report as I look out the window in Madison, Wisconsin, it is snowing. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, on, on that note, thank you, Rock. Uh, and thank you to you all for joining us. Everybody, um, hope that everybody stays safe and well at this, again, very difficult time. And thank you for taking the time to join us today. Okay, thank you, Steve. Stay Thanks. well. <laughs>